Let's see. I think you need to probably yep stop stop sharing. Okay, there we go. Now <laughs> Everybody see the introduction slide? Yes. Yep, it's there. All right, thank you. Again, I want to uh, thank you for the in invite today. And uh, had a, something pop up on my window saying Zoom ended, but I hope I'm still online. Um, if not, someone will get hold of me quickly. Uh, want to acknowledge the other the other uh, authors that have contributed to the work that I'm going to be presenting: Augustine Abor, Jared Asefa, Nick Dieter, Peyton Mahler, and Sandy Johnson. Mm -hmm. Some reason the screens will PowerPoint will not advance. Let's see here. John, you're in the center of your screen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so if we look at the uh, this is the most recent drought drought map uh, of the U.S. and you can see you know we dealt with a severe drought. Uh, Last year, uh, Kansas and Nebraska are still uh, have have a lot of D D three and D four showing up the dark the dark red. So, oh, you know, we're still dealing with this this issue, and it's really centered here um, in, in our area. If you look at a little bit closer map, you can really see where I'm at in Southwest Kansas. Uh, you know, we're we're in that dark uh, red d4 zone so so things are, are are still very rough in in southwest kansas but there's other parts of kansas that are also um you know in severe con conditions the only place really that isn't is uh northeast northeast kansas so so you know we, we've had a bit rough year and, and and things are still rough and we're going to look a little bit at where we might be headed and and how that fits into uh, our forage situation for the coming coming year. This is uh, just the most recent uh, drought outlook map uh, that released at the end of January, and this is for the next three month period. And you can see that, except for really northeast Kansas, uh, they expect the drought to persist over over western Can western Kansas. Uh, Along you know the south part of the of the state and in and all of all of Nebraska, so we're they're still calling for it to be extremely dry for the next next several months, and that's important as we think about go, go, going forward and how we're going to uh, manage through through this drought. This is a, the the outlook for the next three months, uh, February, March, April. Um, the Climate Prediction Center is, is calling for the western, again, the western region and, and a lot of uh, the Oklahoma down to Texas, Nebraska to be in below normal rainfall conditions. So, um, you know, th this is not good, especially if, we're, if we think about just spring forages. So if we're thinking just spring forages, this is our planting window. We're extremely dry and they're, and they're calling it for to, for continued dry conditions. So that does not bode well um, to try to get a spring crop uh, established or produce very much, much biomass. If we look further out, um, you know, it, it, things are, are, are look a little more encouraging uh, throughout the remaining uh, remainder of 20, 2023. Um, you know, we have, we're calling for equal chances of of rainfall, of course, as we all know, predicting weather this far out is is uh, is is hard to do and is not very accurate. So, um, but the near term, in the near term, things do not look good. But uh, you know, hopefully, maybe uh, things will start to turn around, 
and we'll have better better conditions for uh, summer summer moisture at this point in time. If we look at uh, this is some for Ford County, uh, looking at historical uh, rainfall over that over that from 1875 to current, and you can see the the far right bar is the long term average. Um, what we see here is is a uh, uh, you know a, a lot of variability. Uh, first off, and actually, if, if the um, the solid line is that trend line over time, and the uh, line that tracks that's the uh, that's the decade uh, ten year uh, rolling average. So you can see actually our rainfall has actually gotten um, less variable uh, as compared to the early part of the of the century. Uh, and but this is only really a snapshot. In, in time. So, you know, I mean, this is like, you know, in the time scale of, of weather, this is like, you know, one day out of the year. So it, one thing, you know, so a couple of things, you, weather and precipitation is extremely variable in the High Plains region. And we can also, we also look at drought periods. You know, we had a terrible rainfall this past year, uh, you know, the, the less than around nine inches and only two other times we've been that dry. Uh, one time in the 30s and one time in the 50s. If we look historically, uh, when it's that bad, um, oftentimes we bounce up the next year in rainfall, but it's not necessarily the case. Uh, you know, the 30s was bad for several years and the 50s was several bad bad for several years. So, so we could, we will hope that things improve, but, uh, you know, you always have to keep in mind that it could be, um, it, we could be, Hit, hit with a situation where you have several bad years in a row. Hopefully not. We'll look at the frequency of drought where we have less than 70% of annual precip. That occurs about one in every five years. And a major drought where we have less than 50% of annual precip, that's one in every 30 years. And that's what we had this past year is that e extreme uh, drought event. And uh, again, hopefully we are, will not see that um, It'd be nice to not see that for another 30 years. So um, my first question, uh, and and you'll have a be able to respond here. Jeannie will post that. But your outlook of the cattle market going forward: Are you optimistic, meaning higher profit potential, uh, neutral, no change in profit, or pessimistic, uh, less profit potential? So, so uh, please respond where you think we might be headed in the next next few years give you a chance to respond to that. Okay, Jeannie, For everyone that is joining on Zoom, this should have popped up on your screen. You can click that option and send in your vote. For folks who are on YouTube, just go ahead and type it into the chat box on your YouTube account. John, we've got 15 responses. Do you want to go ahead and go forward then? Yeah, would you please post those? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So 60% uh, are optimistic, 33% uh, are neutral, and 7% uh, are, are pessimistic. Uh, another question I'd like to ask, and if you just would put that in your chat box, is what type of fo annual forages are you are you growing? And also, would like if there is a uh, research need that you have, and I'll we'll, we'll circle back and I'll ask that again at the end because we'll cover several different things. But but if you could re just put that in the chat, then that's good information for us to know. Uh, identify some of your your needs. If we look at the uh, let's look at the maybe where the cattle market might be headed because understanding where the cattle market might be headed also affects how we manage our forage, our forages, our cat and our cattle uh, inventory. So if we look at, you know, the long-term cattle trend, we had a uh, uh, inventory, we had a high water mark in 1975 and that number is, has come down and then kind of stabilized since the early nineties. However, um, we also need to look at how many pounds of beef was produced per head. So in 1975, we had about 600 pounds of net beef. 
and today about 800. So even though uh, our inventory is down from that high water mark, our total beef production uh, is, is up. And then if we look at, let's look at our current, uh, the more recent years uh, from, the, from 2000, from the uh, early 2000s to current, they're shown here, 98 to 2003. Uh, the USDA just reached a, released their current inventory, January one inventory, and they show our inventory being down an additional 3% uh, from 2022. So, you know, the drought has had a big impact on cattle in the Plains area. Uh, just it's, it's very similar situation, you know, in 2011, 2012, uh, we dealt with a drought situation. And, uh, you know, we hit, uh, hit the, as a herd started rebuilding, 2014, that inventory was at an all-time low, and it, it really looks like we were, were set up for a very similar pattern as, as 2014. So that's, that's I think, important to, to keep in mind as, as we go, as how we manage the operation uh, and, and, and how we want to, uh, how much we want to risk as far as where we place our resources for cattle inventory and, and forage inventory. Looking at feed, the feeder's price from from early 2000 to current, uh, you know you, you see we had a the uh, you know an all time high of, of prices around that 2014 time frame when our inventory was was low, and if you look at the fall futures price of 23, it's calling for around 215 right now. So again, we're you know we're set up for a uh, a, a nice situation um, for prices. You know, there are some challenges, though. You know, we have inflation. We have increased costs with that. Um, there, there is a concern in the economy. And then, you know, if you look at world supply, meat supply, Australia and, and uh, Brazil uh, ha have the inventory. So, um, you know, it's I would consider myself cautiously optimistic. But if we were in a, uh, a low, lower market situation of prices of beef, then I think uh, it would pay us pay to be uh, more cautious uh, and 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 maybe cull, do some cull, culling even harder than than the current situation. So I think the current situation bears bears us to try and 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 do the best we can to try to keep that that cattle inventory uh, up, to, but uh, also keep in mind what you know what we have available in terms of pasture conditions and, and forage conditions. So we'll talk, we'll, we'll talk about that now. Another question for you uh, that Jeannie will post here is, what is my feed supply? Uh, what, what feed supply? I am out. Uh, you have enough until planting spring forages. You've got enough to get you by until summer crop forages are, can be grown. Uh, until weaning of the 23 crop or until 2024. So if you could post post your responses and then we'll see see uh, how people respond, please. Jeannie, if you could let us know when when you have when they come in. Yes, I'll do. At the moment, we've got six, seven responses here. Let's see if we can get up here just a little bit further um, and we'll uh, I'll send that back to you, John, as soon as I have that. Um, also, guys, I know we asked you to put information into the chat box. I didn't know we could lock down the chat box as much as it was, but it is unlocked now. So you guys should be able to type responses back in on that question that John asked earlier about what are you using for forages and what else do you think we need additional information or research on? So that chat box is unlocked now. Sorry about that. And John, it looks like we have 11 responses in the feed supply. So I'll go ahead and start stop that and share the results so you can see those. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, yeah, thanks. Unfortunately, yeah, a couple, looks like a couple people are, yeah, are out of feed supply. I know that uh, that's a tough situation to be in. I know some, some people are in that situation and, and uh, yeah, trying to find hay right now is, is, a, is a real challenge. Um, Spring, you know, spring forages, growing them was our next option, and several, several are in that situation. Uh, summer forages is 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 the highest 
of the three, and then some are sitting very good until 24. So uh, that's that's if you're in that situation, that's that's a nice place to be. Okay. Thank you. Well, I think Patton had a quote. I think it's a good quote as we start thinking about how forage management and, and drought management going into uh, going in going into a drought. Uh, you know, a good plan today is better than a perfect plan tomorrow. And guaranteed, you know, uh, whatever plan you have, it will have to change and adapt. But but having a having a plan ahead of time uh, when you're not under the pressure is a lot puts you in a lot better position to execute a plan uh, when when challenges arise. So several um, some some things to think about and resources. Uh, first of all. There uh, on the egg manager, there's a hay inventory calculator, and that's that's a good place to go. Uh, it's a good tool to have to put to put all your inventory together and look at start looking at your forage needs and, and start working out a forage balance for what you what you have, what you what your needs are, and what you need to to source. Um, it's always very important to have to test feed um, and develop feed rations for the different. Uh, um, cycles of the of the of the animal or what what trimester the cow is in what what her nutrient requirements are uh it's always important that's always important but in, in, a, in a drought when when feed is so as high as it is it's really uh critical it's even more critical pays more dividends to to make sure you get that get that nailed down correctly and when feed supplies are tight uh how how you can best stretch those feed resources you know, we I'm not going to go into the whole uh, drought management plan, but you need to think about your livestock inventory. Uh, you know, cull, culling some, early weaning. But again, you know, I pointed out that you know there are there are some things here that's optimistic about the price of cattle going forward. So um, depending on our financial situation, uh, you know, it 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 could pay dividends if we can try to hold that cow herd together. Uh, as much as possible uh, going forward, but we have to be, you know, cautiously optimistic about that. M minimizing feed loss and waste. You know, when we're when this feed is expensive as it is currently, it does it doesn't take very much loss to to pay for some feeders and do things to uh, minimize that loss as much as possible. Unfortunately, I've also heard cases that. Um, in a drought and and stressful times like 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 this can be when people are scrambling to find feed, uh, it brings out some bad characters, and you need to be careful, uh, you know, sourcing that hay because some people are 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 trying to take advantage of, of people in a bad situation. So you know you want to be you want to be careful about uh, the deals you make and that you can actually get get that get that feed. You want to have flexibility uh, and and be able to adjust to the conditions. You know we the conditions we are here in in south in southwest Kansas this past year. You know planned on uh, planted a lot of forage that uh, did not produce and barely made a dent in our need. And so the next thing was you know trying to source source hay, uh, move cattle out of the area, uh, and 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 do culling. So you have to adapt. Uh, you may have a plan you think is going to work great, but then if things change and you have to be able to adapt to those conditions. We look at our rangeland, uh, you know, it's really important to manage that. You want, you need to avoid overgrazing. Uh, overgrazing will, will do, um, can cause uh, reduction in, in stand and actual uh, thinning of the stand. Uh, if you remove too much of that, of that above growth, you can have increased water runoff and so you get less utilization of that of that water and a, a, you know a healthy range will recover a lot quicker after a drought than if than if it is severely stressed so cattle have to go somewhere you know you can put them in a uh, uh, either confined feeding area or have some sacrificial pastures or some fields to supplemental feed this coming year you know hopefully we come out of the drought um but but um or we, you know, hopefully we do, but we wanted to delay grazing of our pastures uh, after after a drought because they were stressed this past year to allow plant recovery. If you had grazed grass last year when it was trying to grow in that drought, 
that when it was green, that that those plants would be the most stressed because they never had a chance to store any carbohydrates. So you so you want to try to uh, not graze those pastures until the end of the season, give them a chance to store some carbohydrates and have some recovery. You should expect to have less forage production on that on that native range following a drought. So even if we return to normal conditions, you, you know, we need to expect some less forage production and annual forages can help help bridge that gap in, in the amount of less biomass produced and also in, in having to, you know, uh, give that pasture some additional rest before turnout. We need to monitor for weed growth. So we can have, after following a drought, we can have a flush of weeds and whether that might be uh, cheatgrass or kochia, and we may need to do a, a quick, rapid uh, grazing of those of those pastures, and and then move move them cattle somewhere else. Uh, also, if we're hauling hay in, uh, need to be mindful that we may have been hauling some weeds in with that hay, and so keep an eye on those feeding sites, and and just be careful that uh, you're not uh, if if you introduce weeds that that doesn't that doesn't spread. If we look at our forage, uh, available forages and throughout the, the year, um, we have the native pasture, which I typically we might turn out in May, but again, we, I would look to delay that turnout till, till June to give that pasture some recovery. We have crop residues, we have winter annuals, spring annuals, summer annuals. I'm looking at from now till the end of 23, uh, you know, we have, we have a, a wheat crop right now, which in my area, a lot of that wheat never came up. Some of it came up and I'm afraid died. Um, so it's, we're, I think uh, things have to drastically improve uh, for, for this wheat crop or, or we're looking like we might have a fa failed wheat crop, uh, but that we may be able to utilize that crop. Um, and then if we do have a decent crop, you know, we can uh, you take advantage of grazing some of that, that, that residue. Uh, kosher will come up into that, into that uh, post harvest, especially if it's we don't, we don't have a very thick uh, wheat crop to compete against weeds, so there may be an opportunity there. Um, you know, rolling into springtime, which is we're we're right there to be thinking about planting spring forages so in our area. Probably triticale and oat will give us the most biomass production. Summer annual forages. Uh, I really think that uh, that's our best potential at this point in time for 2023. Just the outlook on getting much of a spring forage production is, is pretty dismal. So our spring annual forage or our summer annual forages would include things like uh, forage sorghum, sorghum sedan, sedan millet. And the crop you type, you select, uh, the traits of that crop really depend on your end goal. So, uh, for example, forage sorghum is really for a one cut system, uh, maybe like for hay or silage. Sorghum sedan has regrowth potential for a multiple hay cut or a, a cut, a hay cut plus graze. Millet uh, is, an, is a crop that is very short growing season, drought tolerant, doesn't produce quite as much biomass, but but could be a good option. And it, it does not have the risk of, of prussic acid uh, like, the, like the sorghum does. You might hear of a lot of other types of species, and there is this Midwest cover crop tool uh, that could be somewhere for you to go and look at other species, but but the ones I've listed here and the two spring crops, that, that's really going to be your best bet for the most biomass production in our area. Uh, the other resource we have available is CRP. Uh, this past year, most of that CRP got, got used, so a lot of that is not going to be available this next year. Now, CRP, you can only graze it uh, every other year or hay every third year. So there may be a few acres of CRP left available, but 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 a lot of that got utilized this this past past year. So that's probably not going to be very much of that available in in 23. Looking at winter wheat or triticale grazing, um, you know, in a, in a typical fall, that's that could be a forage available right now. Uh, we can graze that at about two acres per 500 pounds of of, of yearling weight. Uh, in the spring, we can double that, that rate to about one acre per 500 pounds. And at that rate, we can target about a two pound per head uh, gain per head per day. 
we need to for wheat we need to remove those cattle prior to first hollow stem or the insurance deadline and typically that insurance deadline uh, to remove cattle is is earlier than the first hollow stem we look at the, the growth uh, of, of these uh, winter annuals uh, the that's really dependent on temperature and moisture and it's all based on growing degree days triticale and rye have a lower base temp than wheat so about 38 degrees versus 40 degrees so one growing degree day is equal to the average daily temperature and so as we have warmer days we get more growing degree days and because triticale and rye have a lower uh, uh, base temperature than wheat, we can get a little more winter, uh, fall winter production out of triticale and rye than we can wheat. We can expect about two to three pounds of forage dry matter per acre for each growing degree day. And if we look at our average temperatures in southern Kansas in November, it's 40 degrees, uh, high, of, high of 56, low of 27, March is about 42. So, so November and March um, is right there at kind of the cutoff where we can get some limited growth. December to February, we can have little to no growth. Now, like this week, we've got very, you know, we've had several nice uh, weeks of, of, of warmer temperatures. And so we can get some growth then. Um, so you can't, so it's not that you won't get any growth, but the, the growth in the winter, middle of winter is going to be very limited. In the fall is, is the best time to accumulate some, some growth going, going into winter. In that September, October timeframe, uh, we can produce about 30 to 35 pounds of dry matter per day per acre. And this is, of course, all assuming that we have plenty of water and nutrients to, to work with. So before turnout, uh, the sp small grains need to be about four to six inches uh, because we need sufficient growth to meet the livestock need and also have enough regrowth to keep, to, to keep up with demand. And too much growth removal will, will hurt the plant, set it back and, and limit production. But we, we have about, we're about 200 pounds of dry matter for every inch of plant height. So that four to six inch tall plant would produce about 800, 1200 pounds of dry matter per acre. And again, this would give you about a two pound per day gain uh, when stocked at two acres per, per uh, yearling through the fall winter period. And we can expect, in some of our trials, we've measured anywhere from one and a half to three pounds per head per day gain, uh, depending on stocking rate and forage availability. Uh, some work done with Sandy, we've looked at uh, using triticale to develop heifers, and it, it does an excellent job of growing them, but, um, but it does appear that it could possibly reduce conception. And so uh, in that work, we needed to remove those, those, hef those heifers uh, and put them in a dry lot ahead of ahead of breeding so that conception wasn't hurt. We really, we need to be, when we think about winter forage production, we really need to be thinking a long ways ahead uh, and how we manage that pasture uh, for late winter and early spring growth. So we need to set our appropriate stocking rates. We need to take, take into account maybe what the, how, you know, how dry we are uh, or how wet we are. Stockpiling that growth in the fall will help get us through the, through the, through that slump period where there's not going to be much production and if we have multiple fields we can rotate that that will help us uh and, and we have to really have to have a backup plan because uh that that the production can be highly variable so what what what's our plan if we have too too little like this year or some years uh uh an, an abundance looking at wheat and where we, we go with this wheat crop Okay, so we had to make the decision last fall whether to insure or not insure, and all, all the acres you grow must be insured. So we, we have a few days here to make a decision on whether to short rate that wheat crop or not by March 15th. If you short rate it, you would have a reduced uh, premium re, uh, re required. If you do that, that would allow you to do a graze out program. And then if you did that, you would, it would be available to do with the crop that you want. And then you could turn around and plant a uh, summer forage crop in there. Uh, or if you per proceed to just go ahead and have the crop insured, you know, we're gonna have anywhere from a zero, zero yield to high yield. And what do we do? Um, you know, if it's a really poor crop, you know, try to get an adjuster there early to take a look at it, get those acres released uh, to do something else with, with those acres. And if it's uh, if we have a good crop, um, you know we could either take it to grain production, or if you're short on 
short on feed, you could look at, uh, you know, and, sil and siling that crop could, could be an option. So we've got got several different uh, ways to go here with this wheat wheat crop, but and and uh, the first the first decision is is uh, uh, not not far away. Uh, what we're going to try to decide to do with the crop probably won't see any uh, adjusters looking at fields until after first haul stem, which will be sometime in, in April. So we have the crop residue, whether that be uh, you know the the wheat wheat crop the wheat crop or or sorghum corn crop we have options of grazing or baling um baling is going to net more feed to be consumed so uh we're going to have a lot of tra trampling and 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 defecation on, on feed so about 50 percent loss that that way if you have a, a small grain cereal small grain we can get a little better utilization but but most of our other crops we're going to see uh, not not have as good a utilization as, as baling so if we're very very tight on feed supply uh, baling will net us more uh, pounds of forage to, to for feeding cattle you want to be sure to test feed uh, manage that manage the soil for for the long term so try to not take too much off to still maintain soil benefits we this past year nitrogen was pretty high it's come down in price a little bit but ammoniating uh, these lower quality feed sources can be can be a way to improve increase the uh, protein content and make make a little more valuable more valuable feed out of these lower quality feed resources here are some uh, examples of top picture of, of a corn that was harvested for, for feed, and you can see the leaving the strips there. Oh, this producer did a nice job um, that captured the snow. That's also going to reduce the wind erosion off the field. Uh, here's in the bottom is some leaving forage, forage sorghum cut uh, a little bit taller, leaving more residue out there. It's done a nice job of capturing snow. Right across the field, we have a fallow field, grain sorghum stalks, uh, no, no snow captured there. So, you know, we can manage that forage crop to to have soil health benefits and just how we uh, we just need to be careful about how we go uh, man manage that crop because if, if we are not careful and we take too much off or we graze the ground too hard um, you know we can make a, a bad situation and, and have have precipitation uh, uh, soil erosion loss and and then we can also have reduced uh, precipitation capture and increased uh, evaporation so we'll have be able have make less use out of the limited precipitation we do have and talk now about forage production across some different environments and and nitrogen fertilizer uh, recommendations going going forward to this growing season this is uh, the data we've collected over over many different studies about 17 years of data uh, 2006 through last year this is looking at forage yield uh, with available soil water and the profile at planting. The black is forage oak. The red is double crop forage sorghum grown after a wheat crop or triticale crop. The green is single crop forage sorghum. And the, uh, the, the, the yellow is spring triticale and the blue is winter triticale. So a couple, couple things here. Um, spring terdicale is of, of the crops is, is the least responsive to initial soil water status. We'll, I'll come back and talk more about that crop in a, in a minute. Um, and then all the, whether it be single crop forage sorghum, double crop forage sorghum or winter triticale, they're all, I have a lot higher yield potential than the spring crops and they're more responsive to that, how much water is available in the profile. And you can also see the variability so, take, take, for example, spring crops can approach anywhere from about 3,000 pounds per acre down to um, basically uh, uh, near zero uh, at one, in a crop failure type situation. Uh, single crop forage sorghum, you're going to be approaching 8,000 pounds down to 4,000 pounds on a, on, a, in a, on a normal year. So, you know, we're gonna, we can have a lot higher forage potential uh, with the warm season annuals at the highest followed by winter tree Kaylee, followed by the, the spring forages. Looking at in-season precipitation um, is on the left. Again, the, the same crops, but notice that the spring tree Kaylee has a lot steeper uh, slope. 
So spring tree kale is going to re uh, respond more favorably to uh, in season precipitation than, than all the other crops. And looking at temperature on the right, all, all the crops um, respond negatively to warm growing season temperatures. So if we have a hot, uh, warm temperatures during that growing season, that's gonna hurt our forage production. The ex only exception to that is uh, single crop forage sorghum. So single crop uh, forage sorghum, that summer crop, they, and, and millet would be uh, very similar, I would expect. So those summer crops can tolerate the heat nicely and, and it does not hurt their production like our, like our cool season crops uh, would be. Looking at, this is at the HB Ranch uh, near Brownell, Kansas, um, from some work of Augustine's collected. So you can see at that environment, the, the yield potential is higher than at Garden City, but also, but yet it can still be extremely uh, variable. And where we looking at the cost of growing the crop uh, versus the, the, for, uh, the forage crop versus the cost of harvesting it, uh, we really need to be above 2,400 pounds per acre to, to, to be in, in making money from that crop. But you can see, uh, you know, a lot of years we're, we're in, that, in that range where it's a profitable crop to grow. But if we get a couple of dry years, uh, then, then we're going to be below that, that, that economic threshold where our, our, the amount of return we get is, um, is, not, is not enough to cover the cost of growing, growing the crop. Looking at uh, nitrogen, this is some nitrogen studies we've, we've, we've looked at on, uh, uh, first is uh, for oats um, and triticale, or triticale is the first slide. So if, if we increase end rate from zero to 70 pounds per acre, uh, we increase forage dry matter up to um, 50 pounds per acre, produce the highest yield. And we also increase crude protein content of that forage as we increase end rate. So in this case, 50 pounds per acre, total available nitrogen. So that's what's, that's what's in the soil profile plus additional fertilizer. Uh, that 50 pounds total gave us the, the most forage, uh, the highest forage potential. Above that, we did not see an increase in, um, in forage yield. Looking at uh, oat now, very similar situation as triticale where 50 pounds per acre uh, maximized yield and also uh, gave us a, a nice crude protein content. We, if we bump that nitrogen rate up a little bit higher, we did, we did see a slight increase in, in crude, crude protein, but we did not increase the uh, forage dry matter above 50 pounds per acre. Looking at fiber co content of, that, of the feed, this is of triticale. As we increase the nitrogen rate, we see a decrease in ADF and NDF concentration and an increase in digestibility of that feed. So we're making that feed, increasing the value of that feed also by, with, with, our, uh, with our nitrogen. We can look at uh, the economic optimum nitrogen rate. So we look at the price of nitrogen on the, uh, the left-hand uh, y-axis and then forage value across the, uh, on the, going across the table. So this would, at, we can find whatever we have to pay for the price of nitrogen and whatever the given uh, feed price is, we, this will tell us uh, how much nitrogen we can, uh, it, it pays us to, to purchase. So if we look at, you know, if we're buying that, that, that feed at $120 a dry matter a ton, um, and we can lock in our fertilizer around, you know, a dollar per, per uh, pound of nitrogen, then that would suggest we can uh, apply up to 60 pounds per acre, uh, giving the profile plus the uh, fertilizer. But, but keep in mind, we did not see an increase above 50 pounds per acre. So this would say we would max, so this would suggest we should maximize uh, our, our end rate at 50 pounds per acre to give us the most uh, return. Looking at nitrogen rate effects on forage sorghum, and we had this day we'd collect the data in western Kansas and then eastern Kansas. And here again, uh, 50, 50 pounds per acre um, came out in western Kansas as, as the point where we should target. Eastern Kansas, a little bit higher at 75 pounds. 
per acre. Again, similar situation, economic nitrogen rate for, for forage sorghum now. And if we look at where that puts us, at, again, if we're buying that feed at $120 a ton, same nitrogen price, um, puts us right there at 50, $50, or sorry, 50 pounds of nitrogen is the economic optimum nitrogen rate. If we're in a situation where nitrogen is very high and 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 you know and feed feed price was less, then we would have to back that nitrogen rate off. One thing we've seen is uh, this is nitrogen rate with with forage nitrate. So as we increase, and this is data from forage sorghum, but the uh, oats is responds very similarly. But as we increase our nitrogen rate, we increase the forage nitrate also. So not only is it uh, um, important from a yield standpoint, an economic standpoint, but also from just the quality, uh, having that feed not be toxic. We really need to keep that those end rates down around uh, 50, 50 pounds per acre and not, don't, don't exceed that amount. So looking at nitrogen toxicity, okay, a um, couple of crops that tends to be nitrate accumulators is oats and forage sorghum. And some of the factors that contribute to that nitrate accumulation, uh, soils that are very high in residual nitrogen, you know, excessive nit rates of, of fertilizer or manure, and nutrient imbalances. So we, we can control these, these first two. Um, you know, the, the other is, is environmental stress that we really cannot control, uh, but that, you know, that's caused by drought, cloudy conditions, frost, frost events. We can... Uh, control how we manage harvest that feed. So this is showing the nitrate in the feed uh, with cutting height. And so as we increase the cutting height and the purple is some, uh, uh, some severely stressed plants and then uh, the green dashed line is some plants that were a little bit less stressed in that field. You can see as we increase cutting height, uh, we reduce the nitrate in the feed. And if we, if we cut it high enough, we can really uh, reduce or eliminate that, that, that concern about nitrate in the feed. Also, we can ensile that feed if it's very high and that ensiling will reduce those nitrate levels uh, by, by about half. Here's uh, some plants taken uh, this past year during a drought and you can see the variability in, in, in those plants with all within the same field. Uh, and then looking at the nitrate and prussic acid. So the uh, tall, the tall and medium plants were kind of similar in terms of nitrate and prussic acid, but those really short plants had a lot higher nitrate and, and a lot higher uh, prussic acid to the point where it, you know, would have been uh, toxic if a cattle were to consume that. So you need to be, you know, need to be careful and, and, and do a good job of, of sampling what we have out there in the field. After, after a freeze event, uh, the nitrate and prussic acid were both much lower with that, with that very short the plant, the, most, uh, the plant we, the, we had most concern with, but it's still in the range that we need to be cautious even, even after a freeze event. So just because, you know, so just because you know, we think that prussic acid levels are maybe safe after a freeze event, that's not necessarily the case. So again, we need to sample what's out there so we can manage, manage around that. Okay, Jeannie, I'm uh, gonna have ask for another, another question. Uh, I purchased rainfall insurance for rangeland, annual forages, uh, both rangeland and annual forages, or I do not purchase rainfall insurance. You can let us know uh, when responses come in. We'll give them you know, about 10 or 15 more seconds here. I've got answers rolling in. I'm at 10 right now. Um, we get a couple more answers in, then we'll go ahead and move forward. <clears throat> if you're on YouTube, go ahead and type that into the chat box and we will get we'll get your responses added in too. Okay. Well, we seem to stuck here at at ten. So let me share the results. There you go. Okay. Well, uh, so rangeland, uh, 
at uh, 10% annual forages, 10%, both at 10%, and 70% is uh, I do not purchase rainfall insurance. So I'll talk a little bit about it, but if you got questions on that, uh, reach out to, to myself or um, one of your county agents and, and we can get you in the right, point in the right direction if, if, if you're not familiar with, with this, some of these products. So if we look at just spring out and spring treated Kaylee, um, we took, took a look at the specific periods of, of months that uh, uh, have in, influenced crop yield. And so the, these two crops grown same exact time, uh, we see differences in how they respond. Uh, the forage oat is less responsive to in-season precipitation than, than the, the triticale is, sh is shown here. And also uh, the, for the, the oat is uh, more responsive to plant available water. So, you know, we can make plant management decisions based on that condition. So think about this spring right now, uh, we have very dry conditions for probably for most, most people. And if given those, that scenario, um, if you think it's gonna rain, uh, spring period Kaylee would be, would be the best best choice. So we can can by looking at that, we look at um, bounded soil water in the profile and in season precipitation. And then next, I'll talk about timing of that in, that in season precipitation. But you can see we can get pretty nice uh, uh, understanding of how that crop will respond to to water. And so. Um, forage oat is, is going to be, like I say, less responsive to than spring oat uh, if we get some spring moisture. So that's shown here in the, in the red, or sorry, the yellow and the black bars, lines. So that if we get some rain, pretty Kaylee could do, could do respond favorably. Now, if we have the opposite situation where we have a lot of uh, plant available water to work with, growing, going in that growing conditions, and we expect kind of normal precip, then oats would be probably a better choice from us because you can see we're at the lower end that oats, oats is doing a little bit better job. If we look at the winter triticale, uh, it, it responds very, very favorably uh, and, and very sim, it's the highest of all of the crops. Uh, and so in winter triticale responds very, very favorably across the entire growing season. And the two uh, forage sorghums, the double crop or the single crop, there we see we pick up about 200 pounds for each additional uh, inch of moisture available to us. Looking at specific months, we've looked at specific months of how these crops respond. So we can look at spring oat and spring creek the first two lines at the top for precipitation. Um, you see early, early moisture Spring oat, it's, it's February, and spring crit Kaylee, it's March that responds favorably to, to yield, responds favorably to, to precipitation. Spring oat, we also see a nice response to May precipitation. As we get into June, that is past the growth cycle of that plant, and there's no, that moisture has no benefit to the, to the crop. We really have to have that moisture in that February, March timeframe to, to, to make an impact on, on crop yield. Temperature, um, warm winters, we have, we see a negative response in yield. During the winter, if we have really warm conditions, you know, we, we're going to have more soil water evaporation. So we're going to have less water for that crop to grow as the spring term time comes around. Um, but the crop needs, uh, uh, needs to get growing early. So we see that with April temperature. So if we have a nice warm April, um, but, it, you know, temperatures do not get exceedingly hot in April, but if we can get a nice, nice April, some fall precip with some, with nice uh, April, warmer April conditions, we can get quite a bit of, of forage growth. If we get into May and conditions are hot, that really stresses that plant and reduces yield potential. So um, Northern Kansas is a little bit better as far as cooler Mays than Southern Kansas, but hot Mays uh, and that is, is, is not a good situation. So really need that nice winter precip followed by early, early spring growth 
to, 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 to hit that 4,000 pound kind of yield goal. If we don't have those conditions, then, then, the, then the yield potential is going to be going to be hit. So if we look at RMA offers annual forage insurance, and in in the our work we've looked at the Pacific months and that that uh, for their program that that has the most impact and for for matching uh, yield and and their insurance months. So true to Kaylee, uh, so G, the growing seasons one, two, three, and four at the top. That's what RMA uh, allows you to insure. Then you have to pick these two month periods, and you basically either pick odd months or even months because uh, the months cannot overlap. And then you have the, the crop that you grow match that growing season. So let's, we'll walk through this a little bit. Winter triticale, um, you could plant that early or you can have a late planting. So it could, it could actually fall in within two different growing seasons, but you can, winter triticale is a bit unique in that it, every look at every month, it uh, responds favorably to um, a moisture. So there isn't any single two month period that really sticks out driving forage yield. If that's, you know, we're looking at each one of these two month periods by itself, it responds favorably really throughout the whole growing season plus plenty of water. So, because winter tree Kaylee is growing over so such a long, lot longer growing period than these other crops. So it, it's a little bit unique. Um, spring forages, you could dormant seed those in the fall, or typically we would have more of the, late, the typical late or normal planting. Um, again, that early moisture is, is going to be really critical for drive, driving yield, and that late moisture outside, outside, it's for insurance purposes, you have to insure it, but it has no value uh, in terms of forage yield. So that's a little bit of a uh, downfall of this program is, is it does not match very closely with spring forages of when their uh, forage yield is determined and the insurance months is, is set. And then looking at spring crop, spring sorghum, a single crop sorghum or double crop sorghum grown after wheat. Um, that again, the early, early moisture, so June through August is very important for forage production and that moisture late in the growing season uh, that has less of an impact is that than that early early moisture. Oop. Went one too many. Let's see here. There we go. With that, I think we have some time for questions. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, if you have any questions, uh, let's see here. Uh, why do you see reduced con conception rates with heifers grown on triticale grazing? Ah, uh, that that's a good question, and I'm I'm a forage agronomist, not an animal scientist, so I'll, I I want to uh, specif specify that. But it wasn't, uh, you know, dairy heifers have seen this too, and and uh, the the thinking is is it has to do with uh, uh the the protein levels in the blood re reducing conception so the animal scientists involved in that project sandy um she she could be speak to more of the the uh mechanisms within the within the heifer but it we're not it wasn't unique and that we've seen that similar response with with uh dairy heifers as well all right uh, let's see okay what are your thoughts on summer planted legumes in rotation, cleaning up other fields to go back to traditional small greens? Um, yeah, good question. We have a current project right now where we've been looking at a bunch of, uh, we, we've done a lot of work on cool season legumes and they're, let's talk about, I'll talk about that and then I'll talk about summer. So the cool season legumes, uh, the forage yield potential, their, their forage yield is just too low uh, to really uh, um, cash flow economically. The cost to grow them versus what you get, it just, it does not, not work. We've started a project uh, last year was our first year. Well, we've done, we did some early work, but we've, and we identified some things. And so we grew those plants this past year at Colby, Hayes, and Garden City. 
and we're looking at some potential warm season legumes that would do well under a dryland situation to provide us that uh, important protein resource. And we're seeing some promising results with uh, cowpea and lab lab are a couple that, that, that show some promising results, but, but need, really need some more years of data on that. But, but we're hoping to identify um, an, an option there to grow because uh, I know that, you know, alfalfa really does best if it's, uh, you've got, if you can irrigate it. So, so we're, we're trying to find, find something that might work. Uh, is there anything on YouTube, uh, Aaron? No, nothing. No questions from YouTube at the top this time. All right. I don't think I see anything else. Oh, we got, <laughs> oh yeah. He's looking at limited water. So as we have some more questions coming in, John, one of the questions I have gotten here lately is um, some parts of the state still have some snow on the ground. How quickly do we need to be out getting spring forages in the ground or making those decisions? Uh, yeah, good question. So in our, in our work, the earlier you can get in the field, the earlier you can plant it, the better. So, um, we have planted it before in the in the end of end of February, uh, first of March. It really kind of depends on yeah if you've got snow on the ground or something like that, then it's going to limit you. But uh, you know I expect we're going to turn cold here again, another cold spell, uh, then and then warm back up again. But but the sooner you can get that crop established and growing and get more growth during that that cool period time of the year, uh, the better your the better your yield potential is going to be. Uh, early on, I mentioned if you had, um, you know, what if you could put in a chat box what kind of annual forages you're growing and what other uh, what forage research questions you have that that would we we'd appreciate that information as we uh, with our with the research we do as we develop develop uh, uh, our research testing program. There is a question on difference in bloat between triticale and wheat grazing, and I think Jeannie just promoted San Sandy Johnson's on. So, uh, if we want to tag team that, that's fine, John. If you want to take it, and then uh, if Sandy wants to add anything to that, or have discussion on the conception rate question, also. Okay. Okay. Oh, she's on good. Uh, I think, you know, you can have bloat issues on both triticale and, and wheat. Um, I don't know that there's any, I don't know. Well, I don't know of any research that's compared one or the other on bloat. They can both can be a problem. Uh, you know, it can also, weather ha has a, a, a effect on that. Uh, Sandy, you want to comment on on bloat, cattle bloat? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know that I have anything to add on that. John is that you know rapidly growing forage conditions that kind of changes some of the um, makeup of those. And yeah, any, any comparative data I, I have not seen. And you know, if if we're using those forages, we need to think about using tools to, such as ionophores that may help reduce the risk of bloat and and uh, look at our forage availability and management of dry matter. You, you know, cattle providing some dry hay uh, can help do a couple things. Can help can help with that bloat situation. It can also help stretch that forage resource. Um, you know they don't need th that many. Their whole diet does not need to be cons uh, consist of just that that high, really high quality uh, feed. So some dry providing some dry feed can help also stretch that that feed resource. Sandy, you want to comment on uh, uh, blood protein in cattle and conception? Right. Um, you know the. The dogma, particularly where this started out in, in dairy cattle, where often they're feeding a much higher quality ration than we might to beef animals. 
they were measuring um, either blood urea nitrogen or milk urea nitrogen. Um, and when that's high in the blood, the animal really has more than it can use. And the you know theory was that high level of nitrogen what was what caused uh, some reduced fertility. As we've tried to look at that in our um, beef cattle settings, we've seen some some mixed results. And even in the study that John's referencing, um, the, the result was not consistent over over four years. And my my sense is that we're trying to blame all this on protein, but there's probably other aspects of that in, entire diet that relates to the carbohydrate component that may be influencing some of those effects. Uh, the dairies in New Zealand seem to graze, uh, you know, they manage some of those pastures rather highly and they're, they're breeding on those pastures. They, they don't seem to be taking the hit. Um, so, so I think there's things that we don't quite understand. And if you had your cows out on this triticale prior to breeding, the ability to put condition on those cows and get them cycling before breeding may outweigh um, any negative impact of, of conception. And I think there are, I know there are producers that are aware of this data and still um, using it for cows. So there's some things we don't quite understand. And um, until we do, I guess we have to proceed with caution and, and make our best use of resources we can. All right, All right. Uh, I think we'll kind of, I know there was one more question that came in, but from Lois Imke, but we'll pass that along to uh, either Sandy yeah, or I should, I John. I'll answer, I'll answer it real quick. Uh, uh, yeah, Louise. Uh, I would say uh, comparing beef gain with pretty Kelly compared to wheat grazing, um, you're, you're probably going to get more pounds per acre with triticale than than wheat just because that lower uh, base temperature so it would tend to provide a little more uh total pounds of beef just because that lower base temperature requirement all right well thank you john uh we'll kind of wrap up here just a reminder if you have, need cca credits uh, email genie Paul Jones there at our email uh, and whenever we get the credits approved uh, we'll we'll get that all submitted for you and one last thing uh, we do have an evaluation here we hope you can uh, fill out you can scan the QR code right quick or uh, the link will be put in the chat uh, this just helps us determine future programming and how we're we're doing on on this crop talk series. So hopefully, you know, please fill that out for us, and uh, so we can keep doing these uh, virtual crop talks to help everybody out across the you know western half of the state and even in other parts of the state. And then next week, hope you can all come back on and. Uh, I know there's a lot of talk about climate, climate smart agriculture, uh, especially coming up with a new farm bill that's going to be in discussion. So come here, Peter Tomlinson, uh, give a good update on climate smart agriculture. That should do. All right, if you guys have any follow-up questions for John, you can get a hold of him. He's down at the K-State Research and Extension Center in Garden City. Um, I'll put his email in the chat box if you guys have follow-up questions. Thank you, John, for covering all of this topic that I think is very timely as we're looking at these very dry conditions. So with that, thank you, Craig and Stacy and all the team behind the scenes with K-State to put this, this webinar on, and we will see you guys next week.